Good morning and welcome to our second A2I session. We're so glad that you're joining us today. And as Jill mentioned last week, CGL is very excited to be rolling out this program at the Graduate School. We hope you continue making the time to attend these. And as a friendly reminder, if you attend at least three of the sessions, you'll be eligible for invitation into the ADI LinkedIn group and you'll be able to continue connecting with the amazing organizations that are interested in hiring UNC Charlotte graduate students like you. During today's session, our guest speaker, Amir Ishmael, will be taking a deeper dive into negotiations and networking essentials. Amir will be guiding you through a session focusing on strategies to maximize your skill set in this very important area that's critical to the job search process for all students. Amir is the CEO and founder of AIC Mindset. It's a career coaching and professional branding company. He has a foundation of consulting, strategy, and project management. And he has developed an expansive set of problem solving skills and has the ability to cultivate valuable relationships with clients and internal stakeholders. His experience stretches from strategic execution of engagements to enterprise wide initiatives with a lot of cross functional teams in different sectors in banking, financial services, private equity, and in healthcare as well. We're really grateful to have him here with us today. And just as a reminder, at the end of the session, just like we did last week, uh, Amir will be hosting a Q&A and I will also be available as your executive in residence for the graduate school for office hours. So if you have any questions or anything that you wanna bring up about either last week's presentation or this week, you can hop in, right? Just like the platform says, between sessions, you just go to the sessions button afterwards. And just as a reminder, we do have, uh, well, the platform really has a 10 uh, person max that can use the functionality of the camera and the microphone. So just keep that in mind. Once you ask your question, just think about your fellow um, classmates that might want to have the opportunity to interact. So just be aware of that. Uh, but without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Amir. And um, it's all yours, Amir. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I am so honored uh, to be here and to be speaking to you all today. Um, from what I know, um, I can't see you guys, but you can see me. So I'm going to try to be as enthusiastic and energetic as I possibly can, because I am just speaking to a camera here um, and not seeing the faces. So hopefully um, we're going to have ourselves a really fun time. Um, and hopefully this is um, informative to you guys. And then you find some value that you can uh, utilize in your careers or in the next step of your professional life. So today we're going to be talking about salary negotiations and networking essentials. The primary focus will we'll, we'll look at salary negotiations and, and some strategies to adopt and consider um, as you're thinking of when you're looking for a new job or if you currently have a job and you're asking for a promotion. We'll also look at industry um, standards and best practices. And then we'll talk about how networking plays a critical role um, aspect in your job search and even in understanding what's the right salary range or salary um, price point to even go for. So again, I'm excited to be here and I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to be diving into this conversation. And for those of you that are listening, just please know that if you do have questions in between, please use the chat functionality. There will be a prompt um, where I ask you guys, it's going to be a very, um, it's going to be an interactive session. Um, to chat and, and let me know what you're thinking. So um, the more interaction, the, the better the experience for everyone. But without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm gonna, this is probably gonna be my least favorite part of the entire presentation because I have to talk about myself, but I promise once this is done, we're gonna talk strictly about the content um, and, and the, the topic that you guys are all here for. So um, I'm originally from New Jersey. I graduated from Rutgers with an accounting and supply chain degree. And one of the things, um, and you'll see some of the logos and the brands that I've represented throughout the years. One of the things that I believe has um, has made me unique or, or different than my peers is this idea of mindset determines success. So coming from a first generation college student background, coming from uh, an immigration status background, coming from a financially, um, uh, you know, financially unstable background and being the oldest sibling of three, um, my back was against the wall in many cases. And, you know, I had to leverage this inner strength and this idea and philosophy that no matter what it is, as long as I put my mind to it and I take this vision that I have or had and implement it on the ground, there is nothing that is unattainable. 
And I want you guys to think about that and consider that in your careers, right? Whatever it is that you're trying to position yourself for, whatever salary that you want to get, whatever, whatever entrepreneurial spirits you have, it is attainable with the right strategies, with the right mindset and with the right approach. Um, and essentially networking has played an incredible, um, it has been an incredible element in my life because oftentimes you might not sound attractive or appealing on paper, but when someone meets you in person and gets to see your personality and how you drive conversation, how you present yourself, it changes the game for you. Um, so I went, I also went to a non-target university when it came to some of the higher profile roles, such as investment banking or management consulting. And I really wanted to be a management consultant. Um, I thought I wanted to be a CPA, but it, it essentially it was not for me. So I had to network my way into management consulting because one, I didn't have the GPA for it at the time. And two, I didn't go to a university that they traditionally hire from. So the best way in is not who you know, but who knows you and who can vouch for you. And that's essentially what I started doing. I started joining um, leadership organizations, not just being a member. And I know some of you guys might be involved and I would really encourage that. We were, we were having this conversation backstage, really, really encourage not only to join organizations, but to take an active role in leadership and to define the way that the organization structures or operates or goes to market and the, and the value that you're creating because all that um, uh, is reciprocated, reciprocated um, in, in what you attain throughout your collegiate experience and even beyond that. So through networking and through leadership, I was able to get PwC's attention uh, because I had the administration and staff all, you know, mentioning, hey, you need to speak to this person because he's involved in X, Y, Z. So I got my first internship at PwC as a sophomore in college, and it wasn't in management consulting at all. It was in a leadership um, opportunity. And then I and then after that, I got a second internship, which was in tax because I thought I wanted to do that at the time. It turned out not to be for me. And then I started positioning myself for an advisory role. And at the time, they told me that you don't come from a public, you don't come from a target university. Um, so that's when I started really positioning myself and networking and negotiating as to why I felt I needed to be there. So I got a letter of recommendation. I updated my resume and I put, I, I created a list of skills and attributes that I thought made me a compelling candidate for management consulting. Long story short, I was able to get an interview. So I gave up my offer in tax or audit because that's what they were offering me. Um, to interview, re-interview with the same company for a management consulting role. I got the internship, which then led to a full-time offer. Um, but all of that came through negotiation. That one didn't have a financial impact. That one just had a, I'm just telling you my narrative. And because I come from a non-target school, that does not mean that I don't deserve a position in advisory or management consulting. Um, and I say that as a, an empowering statement to motivate you guys that sometimes you need to vouch for yourself. And it's, it's not braggadocious saying that, hey, I am worthy of this. It's really just standing up for yourself in a professional matter. And you have to back it with statistics and um, market research, which we'll talk about when we get into real nitty gritty salary negotiation functions. So because I did that, my exit opportunities exploded, right? Because everyone wanted this cons a consultant with the PwC background, big four accounting, X, Y, Z. Then I started working at GLG and it helped them build a consulting practice because they were, that, that was a new service that they were trying to fun, um, build out. And I did that as a, an associate. And then I was um, recruited by Johnson & Johnson to help in their contract strategy function, which was really relationship building. And then two years ago, I moved from New Jersey, New York metro area to Charlotte, North Carolina to work at Bank of America. And I'm at Bank of America, I'm currently at the VP level, senior financial analyst, um, really I'm a process improvement lead. So I look at automation and how to streamline the way that finance is done th in the business. So I'm really just a problem solver, uh, technology, um, uh, business requirements, uh, and process improvement individual. So I've been there for two years and I love it. So, and some of the logos that you see on the right-hand side, those are just organizations that I'm a part of today as, um, as a working professional. And um, I know this was introduced. So I also two years ago, I started my own consulting business that I that's my five to nine after my Bank of America job um, and, and, and what I'm representing today. But it is a career coaching consulting business, a personal branding um, shop and a job search optimization uh, uh, consulting agency. So we help people from end to end from the very beginning of the career search process all the way to the end of it 
up to where they're negotiating their salary. So, um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. And if, if there are any questions that come in the chats, I can't see them. So if uh, administration that's listening, please let me know if, if we get a chat and I'll, uh, I'll go over there and, and, and check them out. So I know we spoke about this earlier, but some of the things that we're going to talk about today is how to, uh, what are the steps to salary negotiation? How do you confidently negotiate those salaries and benefits? Um, a lot of people forget the benefits piece and they just focus on that base salary. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll also talk about making sure that your compensation is aligned to what the market um, demands for it or what the market is willing to pay for it. Um, and this, of course, varies by industry. And then what are the characteristics for an, uh, an effective negotiator? So um, these are the four steps uh, that, are, that are put together for salary negotiation. So one, you want to make sure that you understand your value and you understand why you're even negotiating that salary to begin with or what justifies um, that number to begin with. So rule or lesson number one is you have to know what you bring to the table and you have to understand um, you know, what makes you unique, what makes you qualified and what justifies that price point. And we'll, we're gonna talk about you know, the, the subsequent steps are about market research and how to really bring that to life. But number one is know yourself inside out and understand your skills, your accomplishments, your contributions, and your value proposition, which we're gonna talk about uh, throughout the presentation. The second is you wanna use market research to build your case. One is you know understanding your why, what you bring to the table. Two is um, you know what does the market demand for that? Um, and you wanna make sure that you're doing research on many different angles in the industry, in the company, in the geographical location that you're applying. Um, and all of those are key factors when thinking about salary negotiation. Three is you never want to enter a negotiation without a strategy in play. So although you have stats and, and numbers to build your case, you want to have a strategy in play. So if someone says this or if someone kind of rebuts with, with this answer, what are, what are you going to do and how flexible are you? Oftentimes people go into a salary negotiation and they say, hey, I want 50K right? Without having any wiggle room instead of saying, you know, 50 to 60 K or whatever that number might be. But you always want to have a, a strategy in play. And last, um, you want to make sure that you are uh, rehearsing, um, maybe even doing some role playing. Uh, you could do this with a friend, with a coach, with an advisor, and just to see how you um, negotiate. So pretty much you're always in negotiation mode. Like every day you're negotiating something. So whether it's the, the food that you're going to eat, what movie you're going to watch, where, what activities you're going to do on the weekend, you're always negotiating. Salary negotiation has also has a very huge impact in your careers because it could be the difference between, you know, um, investing in that property or in that education or in this asset, whatever it is, it can I mean in, it can have incremental effects to your life. Not only that, when when you're negotiating a salary for a new company that number that you come in with that's the number that you're going to have for some time because assuming that if you don't get a promotion or a raise or a new job you're only you're most of the time just going to get that three percent bonus or that three percent increase and not see really incremental changes so that number that you come in with is very pivotal because you can expect to hover around that range unless you get a promotion or a raise so really quick in the chats, if you guys don't mind, um, I want to understand what are some the, some of the biggest challenges that you guys have in negotiating salary and benefits. So if you guys don't mind in the chats, I'm going to wait a minute or two um, just to see if if there are any thoughts on challenges in negotiating your salary and benefits. And it could be anything that comes to your to, to mind. I'll give you guys another minute or two to, to think about those those challenges and to get your thoughts in. Um, but this this portion will be driven pretty much primarily by by some of the questions. If not, I can talk about some of the challenges that I've had personally. But I'll give it another minute or two.
So I see you're not knowing what is a realistic salary for the position based on I am woman. Okay. Okay. And I won't be talking about um, the, the pay gap between gender today, but as a female, um, that is, I didn't include that in, in the, the conversation, but that is a huge distinction that you want to know and understand um, because there is a huge gender gap. And as a woman, for my consulting business, I love working with my female clients, especially when it comes to salary, because compared to their male counterparts, they're always selling themselves short. So, mm -hmm. Amy, I want you to to know that you you deserve the salary that you're worth. And um, in order for you to come up with what that realistic salary is, it's really primarily driven on uh, market research and the skills that you have. So I can't answer that. Um, I can't give you an answer to that specifically because I would need to know a little bit about your experience, what you bring to the table and what industry you play in. So that's a great, great point. Um, but it is important. I want you to, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as you're negotiating your salary. So figuring out what do I bring to the table, how that should be reflected. Perfect. We're going to be talking about that. The power disparities are large. They just say no, we don't have income for a while. So I think for there, Paul, I think you might be saying that the power might be in their court as opposed to into yours. Um, we can talk about in, we can talk about leverage and how to how to change the balance in that leverage where the leverage is in your court and you could demand a premium on some of the things that you have. Sometimes the salaries are non-negotiable and that's when you start negotiating some of those benefits. But it depends on what you know, if they're after you versus if you're after them or if you have multiple offers to pin companies against each other they see who pays you the most you can you can flip that leverage and make it all about how you're how, how much you demand for that market having the skills and experience that are translatable but not having positions that look like what an employer is seeking jennifer so that's a great point when i would say with this it's all about the narrative that you pitch on your resume on your linkedin and how you go to bat when you're presenting yourself in an interview I can, I can transform a resume for someone that's worked at McDonald's and make them sound like they've had this incredible job because it's all about how you position it. It's the difference between saying I work as a cashier versus I process thousands of dollars in daily transactions for a multi-billion dollar organization that contributes a trillion dollars to the US economy. Pretty much said the same exact thing, but I used much more advanced keywords and quantification that, make, that positions you for that role. And to that point, Jennifer, it's all about, um, you know, how you tailor your experience for those roles. So should I ask if salary is equal, less, or higher than average? We're going to talk about that, Kelsey. I would be a refresher. How do I, how do I approach for salary? Okay. Um, so it sounds like you need a refresher. How do you approach the salary conversations? Abstract, highly specific job titles that are hard to, com to do comparative research on. Absolutely. Maria, that's a good one. Um, and the, the best part is to find the most comparable job for that role. So maybe it's not a one for one job title, but it's what is the most comparable role based on some of those job requirements? I would say general non-confrontational attitude can prevent wanting to negotiate. So one of the things that I'll, I'll mention, guys, salary negotiation is not a battle. It's not a I got to beat the person on the other side. It is a conversation. So part of salary, the beauty of salary negotiation is how do you find that middle ground where the recruiter or the hiring manager wins and you win at the same time? It's not a, I need to get a one up on them. It's how do we find that mutual ground where they go back to their boss and they say, this is what we're hiring them for. And you go back to, you know, your spouse or family or whatever. And you say, Hey, you know, this is, this is what they're offering. So think, just know that it's, it's, it's how do you find common grounds and not beating them? They're not your opponent. They're really, they're, they're, well, you're joining their company, so they're really a teammate. Um, determining the value of your skills. Okay, excellent. Determining what skills are worth in my field. Perfect. That's all about narrative building and how you position yourself on that piece of paper that's a resume or on LinkedIn, which is that platform. Negotiating higher, higher salary if I don't need as many benefits, such as healthcare. Okay, so that base salary, that's, that's honestly, that's the hardest one to move, but it's the one that... Um, that's the most important and impactful in many cases. Uh, benefits versus salary. Okay, we're definitely going to talk about that. How to have the conversation when hiring managers say they have no. Um, okay, and I'm going to give you guys some anecdotes. So th these are awesome. You guys are doing such an amazing. Like this is this is great because this is what allows for a great presentation. 
when we have engaged participants. Um, many times, there was my last uh, client that I supported, and it was a female a client, and she, the job that they were giving her was a step up, but they were not increasing her salary at all. They were saying, hey, we're, and this was an internal rotation. And um, they said, we're going to keep you flat. So if you made X, we're gonna if you if you made 50k, we're gonna keep you at that 50k. And um, and upon speaking with her and understanding her goals and her long term play, it you know this was a good job for her, but it wasn't it didn't match up her long term benefits. And I recommended to her, believe it or not, I said decline the offer, say that you're not ready to move because you know that your sal your ben you, what you can add to that position is worth more than what your current salary is. And at first she was very hesitant. To, to, to follow that advice because it's not easy to turn down a real offer with someone's trying to pay you money. Um, she did it. They came back to her and they matched her exactly what she wanted, which was twenty to thirty thousand dollars more um, than what um, they were offering to begin with. So sometimes playing hardball and vouching for yourself can have incremental effects. Now I'm not saying go out there and decline every single salary because it's very situational. It worked for her because I knew the leverage that she had and how much they were pursuing her. So it worked in that favor. But sometimes, um, you know, uh, vouching for yourself has impact and staying firm on your offer and what you think you're worth has impacts. Now, it's different in COVID if you're saying, hey, I'm unemployed and I need a salary. I wouldn't turn down an offer if, if that was a situation. Just wanted to throw that out there because it, it is different. So I know some of you guys had some questions about, I want to take, uh, Time okay. Um, I know you guys had questions about how do you how do you understand you know what you're worth and how to how to bring that to the table. So, quick um, exercise for you guys. This is just a, a resume and a job description. If you guys can take a quick second, just a glance, look at this um, this uh, job description, and look at the resume that the person is submitting. And I want you to give me a, an idea of what do you think is the value proposition for the person on the left that's applying for the job on the right. So take a quick second. Let's look at that. Um, look at skills, look at accomplishments, look at work experience, and tell me what stands out on this person's resume that um, makes them very worthy and valuable to the job description on the right. And I'm going to exit presentation mode so I can see. Ask and you shall receive. Yes, Maria. You don't ask for yourself. If you don't ask for money or salary, no one's ever going to tap on your shoulder and say, hey, you're doing a great job. Here's an extra 15K. Yeah. Like, because oftentimes, you know, if if Maria doesn't go and ask for her uh, salary increase, they're going to assume Maria's happy. She's content with the money that she's making. You know, let's not move it. The print is small. I can't read it. I'm sorry about that. Let me go back to presentation mode. If not, I will. Uh, I'll kind of highlight um, some of those components. Yeah, to that point, um, you know. So if if you're quiet or you're silent and you don't go and vouch for yourself and and say why you want that salary increase, they're going to assume that you're happy and you're content. So um, there's a professional way to to go about it and and not always make money this the focal point of the conversation but there's a strategic way to navigate that and that really starts with understanding your work um, and what you bring to the table and really it's just taking an inventory of, of what you have to offer so um, I'll go ahead and just list some of those attributes so um, this job experience is asking for about five years of experience I know you guys can't see the whole resume but usually years of experience takes a, um, a, uh, it's a, it's a critical factor. So just knowing that you have the minimum requirements, oftentimes uh, companies will waive that. So if you're like, you know, this job wants seven years of experience, but I only have four, don't let that um, lead you out of that process. I would still put, a, put in an application for that. Um, also, so this person on the left has project management experience. They have process improvement experience. They have communication and presentation skills and they have knowledge in banking and consulting. And that's essentially what this job on the right is looking for. Um, so part one, um, part one of what you need to do is look at those skills and then align that with the job. 
And if you are qualified, overqualified, that's when you know you can ask for an increased salary. So um, just, just know that that's the first exercise that you'll need to do um, as part of the salary negotiation process. So another thing of knowing your value, you want to make sure that you're asking yourself, um, what, are, what are the key differentiators that makes you different? And the way that you do that is looking at um, the value proposition that you bring to a company, right? Um, and, you know, and the only way that you're going to do that is understanding those metrics, understanding truly accomplishments. And that's, like, I want you guys to understand there's a difference between a responsibility and an accomplishment, right? What you are responsible for is different than what you accomplished during your time there. And so as part of the negotiation or interviewing process, you want to have those five to seven to 10 stories of key major value propositions that you had that you brought to a company. And you want to highlight those stories and you want to tailor them to the job description that you are applying for. And that's why I showed that last slide, because you want to make sure that you're drawing a comparison to, hey, this is who I am. This is what has separated me apart. This is what I'm really good at or what I've been known for. Um, these are the some of my main milestones or highlights. And I have an understanding that you're looking for someone that does X, Y, and Z. And these are how I match up to that role. Um, so that's step number one. Um, and, and before you enter a negotiation, you need to know your, your key differentiators. And some of the preparation is to build a compelling narrative um, and a value statement. So a value statement is how you share those skills, those accomplishments um, in in a, in a very compelling way. Um, and then when you're telling those stories, you want to use that star method that I'm sure you guys know, but you create stories. You know, what was the situation? What was your tasks? What were the actions that you specifically took? And then what are some of those results for um, some of those projects that you've led or initiatives that you led? And this is that point where you have to not brag, but really position yourself. And I know um, a lot of the, female clients that I've worked with or friends that I've had, they always shy away from talking about how great they are and how awesome they are and what they bring to the table. And there's a way to do it where you're, it's a balancing act where you're not over the top, look at me, look at how great I am, but it's, hey, this is what I have to offer. Um, and then when you say, hey, this is what I have to offer, then you get into the, you know, this is what, this is what the dollar amount attributed to that is. Um, and you guys know, so you don't, Salary negotiation doesn't begin until an offer is made, right? So you don't, first step, and you guys know this for those that have interviewed, you don't start talking about finances off the, in the beginning unless HR wants to know your budget. And even when HR tries to understand your budget, I usually deflect that question as much as I can. I don't talk about finances until I know more about the job, more about the opportunity, um, and more about my what my responsibilities are because I'm like, hey, listen, I'm taking on my, my responsibilities are increasing. So I need to know that before I know if I'm going to demand a higher price um, for, for what I'm worth. So you are a, you're a business yourself. So someone is paying you to solve a problem. Um, and so, so you want to know, how, you know what your worth is so that you're able to solve those problems. So step number two, guys is you want to use market research and you want to go out there and back your back your worth with statistical information. And I know that there are some questions on that. So these are some areas that you're going to want to make sure that um, that you do. These are some of those steps. So one is I know someone said, how do I find a similar job title or how do you find comparables? So you want to find the most the, the closest job title that you possibly can in that industry maybe in some of the competitors of that company that you're applying for and doing research as to what um, what that salary um, demands. And then so some sites might be, and I wrote some down here, Glassdoor, Payscale.com, the U.S. Department of Labor, um, and LinkedIn. So for, I am huge on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is my primary social media platform. Sometimes roles have uh, stats on what that range is for that job. And that, that's usually very helpful because that's one step down in the negotiation. You know what that range is, and then you can try to figure out where you fit into that model. Um, and oftentimes it's just picking up the phone and talking to folks, um, you know, that have similar titles and not asking them for their salary, but hey, what is a typical salary in that space? So 
that's all part of identifying those job titles um, and doing research. So, you know, before the interview, you want to make sure that you have a range in mind or a target. And so when you're setting a target for yourself, um, you want to aim at above, you know, you want to aim at or above the median. So if you know, and these are hypothetical numbers, if you know that the person below you might make 45K and the person above you might make, let's say 55K, so it's a 10,000 10, 10, dollar range, then you'd wanna come in anywhere from 47 to let's say 53. So, and I'm throwing numbers at you guys. So 45K to 55K and your job is in the middle, 45K, you would come in at 47. And if 55 is the next level up and you don't wanna, you know, you, you don't think you're gonna make more than them because your title is less then you aim a few thousand dollars less. That's your wiggle room. So that is, that might be your, um, your target. And then, so once you identify that target, you want to um, stretch 20% more than that um, in, in your range. So say in that 47 to 53, you say, hey, I really want to make, I, I really want to make 50K. Like that's, that's what your number is. That's what would make you happy. You, when you're going into negotiations, you want that 50K to be your entry point. So you say, hey, listen, I want to get paid 50K to 50, 50 to 53,000. That's my range. Um, I normally like to have at least 5K of wiggle room, like 50 to 55K. Just know whenever you you give a number, um, they're always gonna they're always gonna try to get you at that low range. So if you say, "Hey, I want 50 to 60K," they don't lift, they don't hear that 60K. That 60K is out of the door. They're gonna try to get you at that 50 because they know that that's your minimum. But the good thing is, if 50 is what your sweet spot is, then you start the negotiations. That you say, "Hey, I want 50 to 55K." Um, and that way you can protect your um, the finances that you want um, and you use that as leverage. So, um, and, and that's, those are some of the, the kind of key components. Um, so, and, and research says that, you know, if you start your, what your target range is or target salary is at the bottom, most of the times you're going to get it, um, it, assuming that it fits into the, the, their salary and their budget. Also, um, to that point that I made earlier about saying no to a job, uh, part of what you need to do next or part of this ex uh, exercise or this experience is you want to understand like what is the absolute lowest that you're willing to settle for? What's a non-negotiable for you, right? If they, if, they, if they say, hey, we're only willing to pay you this and say it's much less than, than what you expected, um, then you want to be sure that you're you're i know it's a hard thing to do but you want to be able to walk away um, and you want to know what that number is so if it's like hey if you want 50 and they come back and say hey we're, we're not willing to pay you more than 40 um and you're like hey listen the, the least i'm willing to take is 45 um then it's okay to walk away because when you lock yourself into that salary it's very hard to switch companies sometimes and it's very hard to renegotiate your salary once you enter a company so just know that that number that you come in at it's going to set you in stone for some time um, and just think about what your three to five year plans are and that leads to my next point right like what is what's your budget like, you know does that salary fit your lifestyle like whatever you're paying in rent car xyz family travel Think about does that make sense for where you are now and where you think you're gonna go in the next two to three years? If you're planning on getting an MBA or getting married or expecting a child. Think about that salary, what that might mean for you and your family or your loved ones or for yourself even. Um, and then I also want you guys to remember that if you can't get the salary you want, but it's the job that you really, really want, know that there are other benefits that you can negotiate. So some of those benefits are vacation time. So you know, uh, an extra week of vacation um, is always a good thing. And, you know, it, it leads to greater, you know, time off where maybe you can do something else, take on a side project or just enjoy yourself. Um, if you're moving, I, I remember when I moved to Charlotte, I definitely got a relocation bonus as well as a year end bonus. Um, uh, maybe they can increase your tuition reimbursement. So I know some of you guys are already in academics, but Say you wanted to get a certification or you want to get um, advanced learning um, or you want to go back to school, that's something that you can negotiate. Uh, maybe family or medical leave, uh, any additional flex time, 
on top of your vacation. Um, maybe professional development, so you want to get a Tableau license, or you want to get an Alterx license, um, or you want to learn how to be, you want to, you want to learn how to code, um, or anything else that that's in that range that um, that maybe they can they can provide for you. Also, you can get stock options. You can get um, bonuses in addition to moving. Maybe you get a sign-on bonus. Um, maybe they can, you know, for me, I remember I, I negotiated a title change because they couldn't meet my salary expectations. So I was like, well, why don't we just take, you know, bump me up to the next level? And then once once you get a title change, then your range expands in terms of what that salary might look like. That's a huge one that a lot of people don't know. Um, I didn't know this until later on either, but that, that title is huge because it, it, it kind of sets you in stone to what your range is and, and how you move up because it's very hard to get a title change because you have to negotiate that and that takes sometimes a few years to do. Um, you can negotiate sick personal parental leave, uh, family and medical leave, you know, uh, healthy insurance, I should say health, um, but <laughs> yes, you want, you want insurance that keeps you healthy. And so these are some of those other items that you can negotiate um, that a lot of people tend to forget. Um, so make sure that you are taking this into consideration. I want to be cognizant of time here, but you always want to enter negotiations prepared with a strategy. Um, so really here, um, so one of the things that I want to mention is you never want to discuss salary until the end of the interview process. That's that's. Like that's the first thing that you want to do. And wait until they make an offer. Um, it is huge that you don't jump the gun or you don't lock yourself into a number, right? The worst thing that can happen is you entering the conversation and they say, hey, what's your preferred salary? And you say 70 to 80. Maybe their budget was 90 to 100, right? You just lost um, potentially 10 to $20,000 of salary because you already said something out of line or without research or data to back it. Um, normally, I always deflect that question and think answer. My, some of my answers might say it might be, um, I, you know, I would love to talk to you about salary, but I really want to understand the role and come to some of my responsibilities before we get into those conversations. Or um, I want to make sure that I'm. A, I want to make sure that we both think that I'm a good fit for the opportunity before we discuss salary. So we'd love to, to kind of learn more about the opportunity. And remember, they're going to keep pressing. They really want you to say that number. Um, and if they do, respectfully, you can say, well, you know, I want to do more research. Is there a salary or a budget that you're working with that I should keep in mind? Right? Let them give you that salary. And then you want to ask something like, is that negotiable? Even if that salary is what you want, Ask if it's negotiable because you can possibly get more for it, you know, more for, for what you have to offer. Um, so and I know I mentioned this before, but negotiation is not always about winning. It's about finding those common gains. So um, understanding what their salary is, understanding what your preferred range is, and then trying to find a way in the middle. Um, and you want to anchor your price. So you know you want, you know, let's say, 85. I would say something like, I want 95. Um, or just to kind of throw it out there and see what happens. But then if they say no, I'll say, okay, so my range is 85 to 90, right? If, if I know I want 85, but they're going to anchor the, the salary too. They're going to say, hey, well, we don't, have, we only have a budget of 70. And I've seen, I've seen companies say, hey, we only have a budget of 70 and they end up paying 80 or 85 because it's all about, they, they, they'll do that if you can justify the reason why. They're paying a little bit extra to get a better set of skills. Um, and this all depends on the job market, the company, the industry, where they are geographically and all that jazz. Um, so you also want to try to anticipate how the conversation will go based on research. So if you know what their salary budgets are, try to figure out or try to anticipate what you think they might offer you and how you might react to that. Um, that is a huge negotiation tip because, you know, that's part of the practice and the rehearse and, and kind of understanding what might um, be uh, provided to you before they do it so that you are able to take, um, so you're able to react to it much quicker. So the purpose of why you would enter salary negotiations is to figure out what's the most that they're willing to pay for you, right? Like, and then on the flip side, the company is trying to figure out who can they get, who, who's the best person that they can get for the cheapest amount. 
So you'll see it's two very different sides of the table. One is trying to get the best person for the cheapest amount. The other side is trying to get the job for the most that they were willing to pay. So part of that is to uncover what is it that what is their budget and how high are they willing to go? And a lot of factors play into this, right? How many candidates do they have? How aggressive or how how, how quickly they want to fill that role? Um, how um, how much your experience ties into that now that 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 environment? And I want to say one thing, another anecdote. Sometimes it's not the most experienced person that lands a job. Excuse me, it's not the most experienced person that lands a job, but it's it's the most prepared person that lands the job. Um, I've been in situations where I've seen the resumes after I got hired of what I got the job over, whom I got the job over. And sometimes they were way more qualified than I. And I would ask the question, why did I get the job? And it's really because it was a level of preparation, um, not just in salary, but in knowing the company, knowing my work, what I add to the table, asking smart questions, um, and then just leading with energy and enthusiasm. Oftentimes, you know, people are judging you for who you are and what you represent and if they want to work with you. And then oftentimes it helps them justify what you might be worth because essentially they're taking a gamble on you, right? You could put anything on your resume um, and you could say anything in an interview, but at the end of the day, they got you got to actually show up to the job and do it. So everyone is taking a gamble on that. Um, and so you want to come off as likable and approachable and coachable. And um, oftentimes that can help with um, your salary negotiation as well. Um, you want to be very personal and, and, and let them know like, hey, this is what I need and this is why I need it. Um, I am a huge proponent of never be the first one to mention a number. I think in a salary negotiation, the first person to mention a number is the one that loses, person. Not in every case, but at least in the cases that I've seen. The moment you mention a number, that's the number that they're going to run. With. So just know that. Um, and they can increase their budget, right? Uh, which is what you want them to do. So if they say, hey, we well, only can pay 70, but end up paying you 85, they've increased their budget for you. But you don't want to decrease your budget unless it's a job that you really, really want and it's um, you, you see a lot of great uh, growth opportunities or maybe you're been displaced or unemployed and you're trying to get back out there. Um, so again, salary negotiations and these strategies are very situational. So you have to take this advice with a grain of salt and make sure that you apply it based on your situation and kind of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, of course, if there's anything I can do post conversation, or if you want to reach out one on one and, and understand your your current environment and how you can take that um, to the next level, I'm happy to do that. A lot of the clients that I work with, they end up making anywhere from 25 to 40 plus thousand dollars in salary increases, because some of these tips they never knew. Um, and sometimes it, it ha it's great to have a sounding board to say, hey, you know, this is what they're offering. What should I do? Right. And, and that's the role that I enjoy playing for folks. Um, and, um, you know, it can it can mean the difference between a few extra thousand or even tens of thousands of dollars in your pocket on a yearly basis. And it truly is life changing um, in many cases. And um, you want to make sure that you know how to bring negotiation to a close. Right. You don't want to leave it hanging or. You don't want to seem flip floppy and you don't really know what you want. Um, you want to say, you want to be firm, you want to, you want to um, have data to back you up and you want to make sure that um, you're always being respectful and courteous to the situation. Like, hey, this is what I would love my, this is what I need my range to be in order to, for me to be comfortable with this job. Um, and I know that your range is here. So maybe what we could do is, um, you, you, if you can find out if the budget can be increased and I will continue to do my research or continue to consider it, would love that. And would love to kind of meet in the middle and, and see how we can work. And you always want to mention like, Hey, I know we're in, in, um, discussing negotiations right now, but I just want you to know that I really want this job. And I'm, I, I would love to work here. This company, uh, is amazing. And this opportunity sounds like something I really would want. So you want to make sure that you mention that you're interested in the job and you're not just after the money, um, because quite frankly, I think those are the folks that most people try to stay away from, just folks that just want money and that's their only purpose, but folks that want to add value but are also fighting for themselves. So I think employers appreciate someone that, that vouches for themselves and, and knows how to go to market because it shows a little bit about how they'll work 
um, and how they operate in, in that job environment because you're negotiating all the time in, in the work environment as well. So the, uh, the last step this should be um, is you want to make sure that you're practicing. We don't have time for role playing, but normally uh, what I do is you role play with folks. You know, if you know practice, like if this is your range and this is the example range for a company, what would that scenario look like for you, right? And how do you how do you go about um, kind of interacting or engaging in that conversation? The more comfortable you are in talking about money and talking about benefits, the better it is in the long run. So just make sure that you're having these conversations. Uh, with close family or close friends and, and people that are okay with you bringing up this topic. Um, and if, of course, if there's anything I can do, I'm happy to, to serve as a resource as well. But uh, one of the last things that I wanted to mention, and I'm, gonna, I'm coming to a close in the next maybe five to seven minutes, and then um, we'll kind of start uh, transitioning into the Q&A function, is what I just mentioned for the most part is um, negotiating when you are looking for a job um, externally or even internally and you're trying to switch. The other component to negotiation is when you have your current job and you're trying to ask for more money, but you're not trying to change your job per se. Um, so timing is everything. Excuse me. What I mean by this is oftentimes you, you, you want to know when companies' talent conversations are happening. You want to know when comp compensation conversations are happening you know what time of year is that is that is that in march is that in october is that at the end of the year in december most companies they do that you know a few months before the end of the year so you want to make sure that you're you're asking for these types of items in a very strategic time you don't want to just blurt it out every time you have a meeting or you don't want to sound um like it's not organized and structured like at the at the very bare minimum, you want to make sure that someone is respecting your your inquiry, um, or at least is taking it into consideration, because that is huge when thinking about um, asking for a raise or promotion. And you know, it, it it also depends on how the group is operating, how the company is operating, if it's in a growth pattern, um, if you see an opportunity because there's if there's a new opening and um, on the team and it's a it's a promotion in nature and you can start maybe trying to position yourself for that role rather than them hiring someone else maybe they can hire you so it's all about that timing and you want to make sure that you don't wait to the last minute too you don't want to wait until december and saying hey listen i would love a raise right well we just had the conversations two or three months ago i'm sorry like all the salary increases are already locked in well before december in many cases so you want to make sure that you are outlining your objectives in your your quarterly conversations or your monthly or your, you know, biannually, you want to make sure to say, Hey, listen, I'm, I, uh, you know, I've been here for two years and I would love a promotion or a raise. And I want you to help me understand what do I need to do in order to get that? Um, what do I need to, you know, what skill sets do I need to develop? What do I need to prove in order to get that? And you want to make sure that you say that well in advance so that you know um, what, what are the steps that you need to take? So then, when you have your next touch point, you can say, hey, listen, I know we had this conversation last time. Would love some feedback on how I've been progressing to, to meet that goal. So you want to keep them accountable and you always want to get feedback because the more you do that, the more top of mind they're going to keep you. So when they go into those talent conversations and the compensation conversations, they're like, well, this person, they've been it's going to be fresh in their mind. Right. And they might go to bat for you. They, go, they might go to, to, to fight for you. And then. So networking um, is a big component to this because the people that get promotions and raises and, and salary increases are the ones that are well networked in many cases. But not just with your boss, not with just your immediate boss, but with everyone that's invited to those talent conversations. So if um, if you know your boss and maybe four others that are at her his level are part of those comp conversations, you want to make sure that all of them know who you are and they can vouch for you. Because um, in many cases, they're going to want to, they, they're going to have to approve of, of those items as well, especially when, when thinking about talent um, and who they want to elevate or who they think um, deserves more because of the contributions that they're making. So that's a big piece in, in the networking component in the networking world. Um, so you also, 
oftentimes, like I have personally, I have a board of directors that I go to um, that I feel comfortable maybe talking about money to. And I'll say, hey, listen, this is where I'm currently at. This is my years of experience. This is what I've been able to con contribute. Um, and this is what I think or know the salary ranges are or where the wiggle room is. What do you think if I were to ask for this? Or am I crazy for asking for this? Or what do I need to do to justify this, right? And just kind of picking their brain, asking for advice, asking for recommendations. And oftentimes I'm asking people that definitely make more money than I am to, because they've been through those hurdles. Um, I'll, I'll never ask someone maybe at my level, um, for the most part, I'll try to ask maybe one or two notches or levels above me, just because they've gone through those hurdles and they might understand it better than I. Um, so it's it's not a bad thing to ask about that. You never want to ask your coworkers how much they make because that's a that's a big no. Um, the the topic of salary should not you know should not be within your immediate team. Um, it's it's way way beyond that, um, and that's who I normally ask um, way outside of my team or even outside of the company in general. Um, so when you're ready to have those conversations, normally I have a either PowerPoint or a Word document. And I have a list of all my accomplishments and attributes for the year or for the quarter or for the cycle, whatever it is. And usually I'll, I'll submit that in advance and say, hey, listen, I want to I want to use this presentation to drive our conversation. And usually I'll give them a day or two or even a week to look at it or react to it. So so part of the conversation or not all of the conversation is all about, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. They've already had that. They've already gotten a chance to review. It. So you can kind of maybe highlight the top three or top five things and then let that be reading material for them so they can keep and they can use when they have their conversations. Um, but this is something that you want to prepare for. It's like an interview again, it's like interviewing all over again. And you want to make sure that you take it very seriously when you're ready to meet with your boss or whoever it is that's responsible for your compensation. Um, and then when you meet with them, just make sure that you have a pitch, um, not rehearsed, but at least you know what the main key points are. Um, and then back it up with those details, such as having that document, understand what those metrics are. Maybe it's how you've increased revenue or decreased costs or increased productivity or removed rates or um, did some process improvement. And then answer the why you think you are ready for that promotion or that race. So those are kind of some of the, the big components to what I would consider a very compelling way to, to ask or justify um, a raise. So with that being said, that's that's the conclusion of the presentation. Um, for those of you that are interested, um, you know, feel free to, there, I do have a website called AICMindset.com. Um, feel free to email me any questions or if you wanna follow up and, and have a conversation afterwards, it's AICMindset at gmail.com. Definitely feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, we also have a social media platform for, you know, across every social media. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, even TikTok. Um, and uh, we have a YouTube channel and also a newsletter that goes out um, uh, once a month. So a lot of ways to, to stay connected and uh, for us to kind of continue the conversation outside of this. I know that we have a, a 30 minute uh, Q&A scheduled in, uh, um, in addition to a few other opportunities that I think Jill um, is going to walk us through. Um, but um, that's the end of my presentation, and um, it's been a pleasure being here. I look forward to answering any questions that you guys have. Thanks so much, Amir. That was so full of information and so helpful. And I know you haven't been following the chat, but there are some comments to that effect in there. I also thought there are one or two questions that I think would be helpful for everyone to hear the answers to. And I know once we go to session rooms, it'll break up. Um, so one of them is Jennifer Bosworth, who asks, how do you handle when an application asks for your salary request in numerical characters? In the days of written applications, which I remember, uh, I always entered negotiable. Yeah, yeah, I love that question. I always enter uh, zero, like not applicable. I never put a number there. Um, I would just fill in what other, whatever characters it allows if it wants a number, I put zero because um, don't again, don't mention that number because they might have a bigger budget for you um, and you might you might sell yourself short. So never answer that in applications. That's my personal preference. Again, um, you, you got to do what you're most comfortable with. So I, I wouldn't answer it. Great, great. 
And I think maybe one more, Amy Hoy asked, what do you not want to say during negotiations? For example, can you ask why they are offering that salary? Ooh, what do you not want to say in negotiations? Um, you, you don't want to say anything that's going to shoot you in the foot, right? Um, you want to, I think when, when it comes to salary negotiations, I want to do more of the listening um, instead of the talking. The only time I'll talk is, you know, when I'm expressing enthusiasm to the job opportunity, I'm expressing how much I am grateful for the opportunity. And then when I'm pitching myself and what do I have to bring to the table? And then from there, I just kind of sometimes, you know, not saying anything, sometimes less is way more, especially when it comes to salary negotiations. Cause I think on the other side, they're probably thinking the same. They're like, we're just going to let them maybe talk a lot. And then maybe they'll just say a number and then we could just run with that number. Um, because again, they're trying to bring you in for the least amount. That's, that's also respectful for you. Um, and uh, in many cases, it's usually females that shoot themselves in the foot or uh, uh, members of di the diverse community um, that um, sell themselves short because, the, you know, they have this philosophy of, and I'm, I'm a member of that community. I'm like, I'm just grateful to have a job. Just give me any salary that you want. And that has so much long term impacts to your career. Um, and that's what that, you know, that I'm here to help mitigate that, that pay gap. Um, and the only way to do it is, is to empower you guys to get your worth and to, to get some of those things that you're offering. What I would ask is, is that salary negotiable? Um, do you have the ability to increase that budget? Um, and then you can ask things like, say, if they're absolutely not budgeting, you can say something like, um, is there an opportunity to get a raise at the end of the year, right? Or is, is that salary going to increase? And by how much at the end of the year, if performance is met X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. But I would always try to get it up front. Um, and, and usually I play hardball because it, it because I know what I bring to the table. Um, and I think you know, the more that you're confident in your abilities and what you what you have to offer, I think the more um, more you're willing to kind of stick to your bones and, and, and the number that you want. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so thanks for joining us on the stage, everyone. Uh, great to see you here and actively participating and asking questions. Now you can go to three different places because of this, this hop-in platform that has such great functionality. So the first place you can go is the session room where Amir will be doing a Q&A. So you, and in that room, as Ivana said at the beginning, 10 of you can turn on your cameras and your mics. And so do that when you have a question to ask so you can see Amir face to face. And then if you notice there's more than 10 people in that session room and you're finished, please turn your cameras and your mics off. That doesn't mean you leave the room. You can still be there and watch and listen, but you'll be you'll give someone else the chance to turn on their cameras and mics. So that'll be the first session room. The second session room will have Ivana Campbell, the CGL's executive in residence, holding office hours. Uh, so you can go there. She had so many people in her Q&A last week. We had to cut it off at 12.30. She didn't get to answer all the questions, so she's back for a follow-up. And then I believe uh, the third choice is to go to the networking area. And these choices are all listed on the left side of your screen. You can see sessions and um, you can see networking. So in the networking area, Amir, should they just introduce themselves to each other or do you want them to do a little practice there? Yeah, so I would say um, part of the beauty of being a part of this program or part of this initiative is to meet one another, right? What I would say is introduce yourself and maybe highlight uh, an example of how you use salary negotiation tips, what worked, what didn't work in maybe a job that you were negotiating, an internship. Um, and if you have any anecdotes or stories to share, I would share that amongst each other and share what worked and what didn't work or what you wish you did. Um, and, and that's what I would do as part of the networking session and try to meet as many folks as you can so you can follow up and, and kind of, um, you want to be very intentional in networking. You don't want to just talk about yourself and then leave, but following up and staying in contact. And because the professional world is so small, uh, there are many people that I've engaged with four years ago that are now either my neighbor or they work with me um, uh, professionally or personally. So um, 
keep, you know, just network as much as you can and, and build in very valuable relationships. What will happen if you go to the networking area is it'll say, are you ready to network? You'll say yes. It'll pair you with someone. You'll have three minutes to get to know each other. So it's a little like speed dating, but speed networking. And then if you would like to uh, trade contact information with that person, you can just hit exchange contact information. And if both people hit it, it will give you their information at the end. So let's now transition. Um, and by the way, as the platform name indicates, you can hop in and out all of these sessions. So you can hop into a Q&A room, leave, go to a, Ivana's office hours, come back to Amir's Q&A, you can move all around. Uh, so we will see you in the session rooms. Thank you, Amir, for the great presentation. Absolutely, my pleasure. See you guys in the Q&A.